Hello and welcome everyone to this podcast for human genetics. In this podcast, we are going to begin our discussion on inheritance. Throughout this and the next several podcasts, we will um, begin our discussion of how genes, either one or multiple genes, are, are passed on from parents to their progeny. We'll also look at some tools available to geneticists as we try to understand inheritance at a finer level. It's always good to remember that the field of genetics itself, as a, as a scientific discipline, is roughly 100 and 120 years old, and if, we, if we think about from when Mendel first made his discoveries. However, that doesn't mark the first time that humans have been interested in, in understanding heredity. For instance, we know that, say, roughly 10,000 to 12,000 years ago, Humans were very interested in optimizing crops and livestock to maximize their yields. Now, they didn't know they were studying inheritance, perhaps, but they certainly knew by crossing, for instance, certain wheat plants, that they would get better yields. And we know this from studies of Middle Eastern communities. Another piece of interesting information is we know 2,000 years ago, roughly, that teachings in the Talmud, which is holy book of, of Jewish rules and traditions. In this book, there is a teaching that, that says if two sons die due to bleeding, then none of her other sons or her sister sons were to be circumcised. Now, at the time, they didn't likely understand the reasoning for this, but we now know today that hemophilia is on the X chromosome. And so if a mother, and we can just draw her like this, was heterozygous for this mutation, so we'll put a minus and a plus, when she has a son, half of her sons will have hemophilia, these here. And they will be sensitive to hemophilia, that is, um, they could bleed to death if they get minor cuts. That would be caused by a circumcision. So while we understand it today at a molecular level, back then they didn't understand it at that level, but it made good sense. So being humans, we've been interested in how these traits are inherited, even if we didn't understand genes or chromosomes. Sometime in the 17th century, a group of scientists came up with this idea called preformation. And in general, there were two schools of camp for preformation teachings. One stated that in the sperm, there was a tiny preformed human being and it was just waiting to find its home in an egg so it could grow and develop. They were referred to as the spermists. Similarly, there was a group that believed that there was a little tiny human that was just hanging out in the egg waiting for the sperm to activate its development in the egg. This teaching under the preformation um, would have been called the ovist. We now know this is wrong and not, not the best explanation of inheritance, but at the time they didn't completely understand what was going on. This idea actually lasted for quite some time though, even though it seems that if a tiny human was in the sperm or a tiny human was in the egg, that it would seem unlikely that children, progeny, would have characteristics of both mom and dad. You would assume that the characteristics would only come from one or the other. Sometimes we're slow to learn. Another theory that came along made perhaps a little bit more sense, and that is called pangenesis. And in this idea, I'm going to draw an amazing looking stick figure here. What was hypothesized in this idea was that there were tiny little particles all through our throughout our body and all of our tissues and all of our limbs on all of our parts and these particles they called gemmules 
I will never ask the word Jimuel on an exam, but just in case you were curious. And what would happen is that all of these Jimuels will migrate to the gametes. And that way, the gametes, the sperm or, and the eggs, would have a collection of all the characteristics of this individual. This idea lasted for quite some time. It was disproven by a series of experiments that we don't have time to talk about. But suffice to say that this is not the way that inheritance occurs. But it was a step, I guess, in the right direction. So we can put an X through this. Now, our current model of inheritance requires this theory called the germ plasm theory. We call it a theory because the word theory in science means that there's a large body, a large collection of evidence from multiple disciplines over a long period of time that supports this. Sometimes the word theory gets thrown around in, in the media or just in our everyday um, speaking to mean something that is not very strong. But in science, when we say the word theory, it's important to remember that that means it is a very strongly supported idea with a lot of evidence to back it up. So let's draw our famous stick figure here. And all this theory says is that all the information, all genetic information is stored in the gametes, or what we might call stored in the germplasm. So they're all going to be in the gametes. I'd like to now focus in and talk about the inheritance of a single gene, just one gene. We know in humans we have somewhere between 20,000 to 23,000 genes. We know of this number of genes that when one of 8,000 or so are mutated, it can lead to diseases, inherited diseases. So 8,000 genes, when mutated, are linked to a disease. Over the past many decades, since Mendel started this field, at least the field that we now call genetics, we understand how single genes can lead to diseases. So let's just write single gene diseases. We can predict probability someone will inherit a disease. For instance, if we know a parent has Huntington's disease, we know that any child born from them, there's a 50% chance that they will have the disease. So this is based upon probabilities. The second one is because we understand genetics at a, at a more of a molecular level today than we did, of course, say 50 or 100 years ago. There are tests that can determine if you have a mutated gene. A third point I'd like to make is that certain populations are more likely to have certain diseases. That is, certain single gene diseases. And this occurs for many reasons, and we'll talk about this later in the semester when we talk about population genetics. But we know when we have more isolated communities that certain mutations may be in a higher proportion in those communities. The last thing I want to point here is that because we understand single gene diseases a little bit better, is that offers some possible treatments. For instance, if we know a particular gene, when it's mutated, leads to a disease, then perhaps by giving the person the product of that gene, say the protein, then that might offer an effective treatment. So treatments are possible using our genetic knowledge. Now those four points I just made on that last whiteboard were all possible because of this 
Austrian monk named Gregor Mendel, who is known as the father of genetics. Now, as I said before, he wasn't the first person to ever do genetic experiments, but he was the first one to apply rules to him so that we could make predictions. Now, a few things about Gregor Mendel that I'd like to tell you about to kind of give you a little bit of the background on him. He was born and raised in what is now the Czech Republic. He was born into a poor farming community. And because of this, from an early age, he understood and was fascinated with planting crops, looking at their traits, which of course would um, be useful later in his life. Back in this time, to get an education, often individuals would go to a monastery. And that's what Mendel did, or that's where his parents sent him. And while in the monastery, he became educated and he learned a great deal and he did eventually become a priest. In his studies, though, he also was able to dive into his love of botany and his love of math. These two passions of his really benefited him in his future studies with the pea plants that we'll talk about. He was able to make similar observations that other people made, but he was able to apply math and logic and statistics to it to make some really interesting predictions. His Initial P studies that he published were in 1866. A few years after that, so let's put here um, studies published. And the sad thing is because back in the 1860s, there wasn't an easy way for scientific disco discoveries to be sent to other scientists. So his studies were largely unrecognized. He later moved into more administrative roles and left his studies behind and he died in 1884. Again, at his death, his studies while published were not recognized. Nobody had really read them. Turns out, and I won't go into great details to this because we need to move on, but in 1900 there were three other botanists who made similar findings that Mendel found. And when they started looking into the literature, they discovered Mendel's work. And to their credit, they could have just hid Mendel's work and took, it and, and took the glory of it, but they rightfully gave him credit for his, being the first to make these discoveries. And so it wasn't really until 1900 that he was formally recognized for his, his findings. Now, as you've probably heard before that Mendel's research was based on pea plants that he grew. There were some advantages to working with pea plants, some of which I am sure he recognized at the time as being um, advantageous for his studies. So when you make pea plants, you get lots of progeny. Now today we might pick a different organism, say fruit flies, yeast, various kinds of worms, that also give us lots of progenies, but peas were a convenient um, thing for him to study. In general, they were easy and inexpensive to grow. And I suspect when they were done with his studies, they ate the peas, so it served two purposes. There is a relatively short generation time, which for the peas was about 35 days between the time you planted them and you could actually make your observations. Now today, this is turns out to be a pretty long generation time because we have model organisms that grow much faster, but in the 1850s, 1860s, this was a pretty good choice. Something you can do with a lot of plants, including the pea plants, is that you could cross them from one plant to the other or, well, let's say cross, cross two different plants, or you could self-cross them. You could take a single plant, because plants would have both male and female reproductive parts. So you could take a single plant and self-cross, and that turned to be, out to be very advantageous for Mendel. The characteristics that he looked at were easily observable. He looked at uh, 
the color of the pea plant. He looked at if they were tall or short, if the peas were wrinkled or smooth, yellow or green. So he looked at many different things that were easy to observe. Well, I think this is a convenient place to end this first podcast on Mendelian inheritance. In this podcast, we talked about the history of inheritance. We introduced the concept of a single gene inheritance. And then we talked about the history of Mendel, why he chose peas as his genetic model organism, and why that was a pretty good choice based upon his studies. Now, in the next podcast, we're going to talk about Mendel's first law. We're going to look at the individual pea crosses he did and how that led to his first law of segregation. And then we'll talk about his second law. And his second law was the law of independent assortment. If you have any questions, please let me know. If not, I'll see you on the next podcast.